Hey, welcome back to Mrs. B Reads. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We are working on <laughs> I Am Malala. That was my sticky note that said record chapters 7, 8, 9, and 10. So uh, we're on chapter 7, The Taliban in SWAT. This is part 2, page 44 in this edition of the book. The radio mullah continued his campaign against anything he deemed un-Islamic and Western. People listened to his broadcast regularly, many to hear him announce names and make sure theirs weren't on the list. Though his illegal radio broadcast, I'm sorry, through, through his illegal radio broadcasts, he encouraged parents to refuse polio vaccinations for their children. He claimed that this medical aid was not meant to help. He said it was a ploy by Western countries to harm Muslim children. But he wasn't just interfering with health care and speaking out against girls' schools. He was also threatening barbers who offered so-called Western haircuts and destroying music stores. He persuaded people to donate their jewelry and money, and he used the funds to make bombs and train militants. We had seen Fazlullah's followers with their long hair and beards, dressed in black turbans and white shalwar kamits in the small towns on the way to visit our family in the mountains. His men carried guns and walked menacingly through the streets. But even though we had not seen his men in Mingor proper, we felt his presence. It was as if he spoke from the heavens, casting a dark cloud of fear over our valley. The police tried to stop him, but his movement was only getting stronger. In May 2007, he signed a peace agreement with the government saying he would stop his campaign against polio vaccinations and girls' education, as well as his attacks against government property, and the government would allow him to continue his broadcasts. In July, everything changed. Around the time of my 10th birthday, the Pakistani army led a siege of, women's, of a woman's madrasa in Islamabad, our nation's capital. A group of militants that had been taking an active stance against the government had now taken hostages and hidden inside the madrasa of La Maji, or the Red Mosque. After the army's attack, which lasted for days and ended in many deaths, Fazlullah made one of his strangest announcements. He declared war on the government and called for people to rise up in violence. The peace treaty he had signed became nothing more than a memory. But the government ignored him like an, an annoying fly and it, it ignored us too, the people in SWAT who were under his thumb. We were angry with the government and angry with these terrorists for trying to ruin our way of life. But my father said our family should do its best to ignore them as well. We must live a full life if only in our hearts, he said. And so, as usual, our family dinner conversations were about things of the mind, Einstein and Newton, the poets and the philosophers. And as usual, my brothers and I fought over the remote, over who got the best grades, over anything and everything. Somehow I could ignore the Taliban, but I could not ignore these two annoying characters. Fighting with your brothers, I told my father, is also part of a full life. Soon, Fazlullah joined forces with Tariq e Taliban Pakistan, TTP, or the Pakistan Taliban, and announced that women were banned from public places. The males in the family should enforce this order, he said, and keep tight control over their families or be punished themselves. Within six months, the streets became strangely absent of women because they were afraid to go out to do their shopping. The DVD shops that sold Bollywood films and children's movies pulled down their shutters and went out of business. Fazlullah claimed that watching movies and TV shows was a sin because it meant that women would look upon men and men would look upon women who were forbidden to them. Under the threat of his followers, people were terrified. Some took their TVs, DVDs, and CDs to the public square where the radio mullah's men set them on fire. Stories spread that his men were patrolling the streets in pickup trucks, shouting his orders from megaphones. Then we heard that his followers were listening at people's doors. If they heard a TV, they bashed the door in and then smashed the TV to bits. 
After school, my brothers and I cowered in front of our beloved TV, the volume turned down to a whisper. We adored our shows and didn't understand how wrestlers with funny names and a little boy with a magic pencil were so bad. But every time there was a knock on the door, we jumped. When our father came home one night, I asked him, Abba, will we have to burn our TV as well? Eventually, we moved our TV to a closet. At least if strangers came to the door, they wouldn't see it. How had this happened? How did an unschooled fanatic turn himself into a kind of radio god? And why was no one prepared to defy him? Through it all, the Kushal school carried on as usual. A few more of our classmates dropped out, but the rest of us appreciated our schooling all the more. Our class even had a discussion. The government may not be behaving as it should, but could we run our classroom a bit more like a democracy? We hit on an idea. Since the most studious girls always sat up front, we would switch seats every week. If you got to the front row one week, you'd find yourself in the back the next. It was a bit of a game, but it was our small way of saying that all girls and all people are equal. But beyond the walls of our school, Mingora had become like a prison. Banners that read, women not allowed, were strung up at the entrance to the market. All music and electronic shops were shut down. Fazlula even outlawed an old fashioned children's game called Karum, where we flicked discs across a wooden board. He had started announcing the names of schoolgirls on his radio show. Miss so-and-so has stopped going to school and will go to heaven, he said. Or, Miss so-and-so has left school and I congratulate her parents. My mother now insisted that I never walk to school by myself for fear that I would be seen alone in my school uniform by the Taliban. Every day, I noticed that a few more of our classmates were missing. And every night on his radio show, Fazlula kept up his attacks, saying that girls who went to school were not good Muslims, that we would go to hell. One day, one of our teachers went to my father and said he would no longer teach girls. Another said he was leaving to help Fazlullah build a religious center. It was a dark day. The Kushal school, which had always been our refuge, had fallen under the shadow of the radio mullah. Fazlullah had set up a public court to enforce his edicts and his men were now flogging or killing policemen, government officials, and other men and women who disobeyed him. Hundreds gathered to watch the flogging shouting, Allahu Akbar, God is great with each lash. Some, sometimes people said, Fazlullah arrived at the proceedings, galloping in on a black horse. Much of Fazlullah's justice was exacted in the dead of night. Later in his reign of terror, violators were dragged from their homes and killed. Their bodies would be displayed in the green square the next morning. Often a note was pinned to the body. This is what happens to spies and infidels. Or do not touch this body until 11 a.m. or you will be next. Before long, people had a new name for the green square. They started calling it the bloody square. I shuddered to hear these stories. What was becoming of my city? What would become of us? God, I said when I went to bed, I know you are busy with many, many things around the world, but do you see what's happening here in SWAT? One night I overheard my parents talking in a hushed voices. You must do it, my mother said. To be afraid is no solution. I will not go without your blessing, my father said. God will protect you, she said, because you are speaking the truth. I stepped out of my hiding place and asked what was going on. My father said he was going to a meeting that night to speak out against the Taliban. And after that, he would travel to Islamabad to take the government to task for not protecting its citizens. My father, a simple principal, was taking on the two most powerful and dangerous forces in the country and my mother was standing by him. Most Pashtun women would cry and beg and cling to their husband's sleeves, but most Pashtun men would ignore their wives. Few would have ever even consulted with them in the first place. But my parents were not like other parents. 
My father is like a falcon, the one who dared to fly where others would not go. And my mother is the one with her feet firmly planted on the ground. For my part, I took on the job of locking the house each night when my father was away. I went around the house once, twice, often three times, making sure all the doors and windows were locked. Sometimes my father came home quite late, sometimes not at all. He took to sleeping at his friend's houses occasionally, just in case he was being followed. He was protecting us by staying away, but he could not protect us from worrying. Those nights I heard my mother praying until all hours. One day, I was traveling to Shangla with my mother and brothers. We didn't own a car and one of our cousins was giving us a ride. As the traffic slowed to a crawl, he put in a cassette to pass the time. Suddenly, he ejected his tape. He scrambled to gather up the other cassettes he kept in the glove box. Quick, he said to my mother, hide these in your handbag. Two men drew near our car. They were wearing black turbans and camouflage vests over their shalwa kameets. They had long hair and beards, and they were carrying Kalashnikov automatic weapons. I was face to face with the Taliban. They were searching cars for anything they claimed was forbidden by Islam. None of us said a word, but I saw my mother's hand shake as she gripped her purse where the haram items were hidden. She pulled her veil more securely across her face and lowered her gaze to her lap. The Talib leaned in the back window. His eyes bored into mine. Sisters, he said to both of us, you must wear a burqa, you are bringing shame. Here was a Talib with a machine gun just inches from my face. How was I bringing shame? I wanted to ask him. I was a child, a 10 year old girl, a little girl who liked playing hide and seek and studying science. I was angry, but I knew it would do no good to try to reason with him. I knew I should have been afraid, but I only felt frustration. When we returned home from that visit to Shangla, we found a letter from my father taped to the school gate. Sir, the school you are running is Western and infidel, it said. You teach girls and you have a uniform that is un-Islamic. Stop this or you will be in trouble and your children will weep and cry for you. It was signed, Fadayeen of Islam, devotees of Islam. The Taliban had threatened my father. Now I was afraid. Don't forget to like and subscribe.